welcome everyone. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about living with congenital or early onset glaucoma. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the challenges, and the opportunities and people's experiences of moving from children's services to adult services. I'm Liz Ball, Glaucoma UK's Development Manager for Northern England. And with me is Joanna Bradley, Glaucoma UK's Head of Support Services. Joanna is going to be keeping an eye on the question and answers and the chat for us, as well as doing some of the technical magic. And also Kay Holmes, Glaucoma UK's Professional Development Lead is here and she's um, looking after Facebook. So if you're listening on Facebook, and you've got any questions, type them in the feed and Kay will be passing them over into Zoom for our panellists. And I'm delighted to welcome our two panellists today, Amber Smith, a young person with congenital glaucoma, and Velota Sung, an ophthalmologist at the Birmingham Midland Eye Centre. Hello. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about the transition from children's to adult services from both the perspective of an eye care professional and a young person with glaucoma. Before we get started, just a few brief words about how the session will work. There will be two short polls during the session, one in just a moment and one towards the end. And these are just to help us see how useful the session's being, how much people are learning through it. We want this session to be really interactive, for it to be a conversation between our panellists and you as the audience. So please do ask questions in the question and answer box and type in comments into the chat box. And we, we will be um, answering as many questions as we can. And we do also want to hear about your experiences. So please do use both the Q&A and the chat. And the poll is now up. So please do, do respond to the poll if you can. And we're going to start with a very short presentation from the Lotus Sung. And then Amber's going to introduce herself and talk a bit about her experiences. But then it's over to you and we want your, your questions. Um, so without further delay, I'm going to hand over now to Velota. Um, Velota, thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, well, uh, thank you very much for, for your invitation today uh, to, to be on the panel. And uh, I try to share my slides, see whether, can you see my slides now? Yep, can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my slides. And um, so basically what I'm going to talk today is uh, talking about uh, tra the, the transition services uh, that we have uh, in the, our NHS um, hospital at the moment. So uh, as, as all of you know, Glaucoma started uh, in children. Started can be can can start it from very young age, uh, like babies, uh, or or they can start in teenagers. So, but most of the glaucoma, most of the pediatric glaucoma, they tend to start very young, especially congenital glaucoma. So they usually start up uh, the their, their treatment at the children at the children's services, like the children or local children hospital, and uh, or the uh, pediatric uh, ophthalmology unit. And uh, but when the when these children go grow go, uh, grows up and then they they usually about fourteen or sixteen years old then usually the transition services need to kick in and um, and especially uh, especially for children who has been treated in the children hospital services but some 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 children are uh, started their treatment in some specialist center uh, uh, usually uh, like a few center in UK uh, tertiary. Tertiary Refill Center for Pediatric Glaucoma Treatment. So like the one, uh, the services in Morfields and Birmingham where, where I am and uh, also Manchester. So if, if the children are treated in the tertiary uh, pediatric glaucoma service, 
then they usually do not need transition service. They just carry on because this uh, specialist service, uh, these uh, specialist services, they usually treat children and adults at this, uh, in the same clinic. So these children can have more seamless, uh, uh, well, there will be no transition. So they, they will follow the same team and as they grow, as they grow, as they grow up and grow old. So when necessary, so when 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 the, when children need to be trans uh, transferred to a to an to adult unit in uh, uh, before eighteen years old, uh, then um, the, um, the planning should really start at about uh, uh, about sixteen years old, and uh, and and usually there's there should be some local defined transition pathway between the pediatric and the and the and the adult glaucoma services. But there are challenges uh, in this period, at this particular, and when children need to transit between the two services, there are quite significant challenges. As the children becoming teenager and they are uh, becoming a young adult, they become more independent and uh, they, they, they need to start administering uh, jobs uh, themselves, glaucoma eye treatment themselves, and they need to remember that they need to put the eye drops in at the, uh, at the time that they need to put it in, and they need to remember uh, to attend to their clinic appointment because they become more independent, and also when they turn when they when they turn up to the to adult unit adult unit, then there will be uh, the environment is very different to pediatric or children hospital, and uh, usually the adult uh, uh, unit is usually more a lot more busier, and there will be and and with less uh, less staffing uh, to support uh, to support the patients. Uh, compared to the pediatric uh, unit, and also the clinician will be a, 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 an entirely brand new uh, team of clinician. clinician. Will tend to because that when 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 the children when they have been going to the pediatric units, they probably have, has been seeing similar, uh, very uh, similar clinician and the nurses uh, for many years. So they will have to get used to very uh, a lot of uh, new people. So this is definitely a very frightening experience for most young adults and their parents. Especially, and, and this is more so for patients with special needs, uh, like a, a patient with learning disabilities. So, and apart from that, for the or the disease itself, it's also quite a challenging period, because uh, usually when the, when patients has had uh, a glaucoma glaucoma surgery when they're very, when they're very young, they either have a gonadotomy, trabeculotomy, this type of uh, treatment for congenital glaucoma, or they had. Uh, a, a congenital cataract, and that has been removed during the first uh, few years of life, and they have got some, uh, and they've been on glaucoma treatment since, and at, and and they some some even may have had multiple surgeries before, like trabeculectomies or even tube implant surgery, and uh, when they were when they were younger, and usually when they trans when they are uh, at the transition at about sixteen years old, uh, a lot of these glaucoma treatment. Like trabeculectomy or or most of the glaucoma surgery, there's a there's there, there's a lifespan for most of the uh, most of the surgery, and usually at this time, a lot of these uh, glaucoma surgery they have had when they were young, is could becoming uh, becoming uh, 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 coming to the end of the uh, end end of the uh, uh, survival period, what we call, and then they may well need further uh, glaucoma surgery at this stage. And then, but then at this stage, the eye could be more complex because the eyes may have had multiple surgery in the past. So more complex surgery may well be needed at this stage, like a chip shunt implant. And, and uh, I, I found actually quite commonly, quite commonly for most of the uh, patient uh, trans transfer from the pediatric glaucoma uh, service to us. And then usually after one or two years, very likely we have to do some kind of procedure, either try to uh, make the previous glaucoma surgery uh, work better, or even have to perform a new glaucoma surgery for them. So, each um, uh, uh, each uh, department should have their transition pathway from the pediatric to the adult services, and this transition pathway should involve both pediatric and adult te glaucoma team, and they should uh, they should have uh, they should. Uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, provide a joint clinic, a transit joint trans trans transition clinic, so that the pediatric and the adult uh, glaucoma uh, team could be to get 
uh, can get together to see some of the patients that they're going to be to to uh, to transit between the two services, so that the pediatric team, which the patients are more familiar with, can introduce can introduce uh, the adult service uh, the personnel from the adult service uh, to them, and also we need to identify uh, a responsible individual. These are usually the consultant, uh, cons consultant, uh, glaucoma consultant of the adult service, or the service coordinator of the of the adult service, uh, become a, uh, well, will be responsible to help with the transition uh, process. And also, some some patients, um, uh, some patients um, would be useful for them to pay a visit to the adult clinic before the transition happens, so they get, they can get themselves familiar with the uh, with the adult uh, unit. And particularly concerned, we, uh, we need to uh, give to the patients who has got learning disability, autism, or other, uh, or other, 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 uh, or other uh, uh, special needs. So this is how how we how we do in Birmingham, and um, so we every every single every every year we we uh, twice uh, two times uh, two two clinics we. Uh, through transition clinic every six months we get together and uh, to the two teams will uh, then we see some of the uh, patient that will need to transition so that's to, to smooth the pathway uh, before they come to our clinic and these um these are uh, these services are now the transition services are underpinned by a CQC report that was uh, published in June 2014 and titled from porn to into the sea and that is available online as well so that in that report, they look into all the uh, the transition uh, services from pediatric to adult at the time, and they have made it's not only for ophthalmology. This is transition from uh, other sub uh, other specialties as well. So they identify the uh, some of the key points that the transition services how a transition service should look like. They should there should be a key accountable individuals, and a documented transition plan, and. Uh, and um, a, a communication or health passport, or even better nowadays is a transfer of the electronic patient record. So that as we know, uh, missing information between the two services and no gaps in position in, in provision between the, uh, two, the children and adult services will be, uh, will, uh, will be important. And uh, also training advice to prepare the patients and the parents for the transition, especially on, the, on consent and advocacy. And nowadays, the CQC inspection will include the transition services as well that will factor in uh, their overall rating for the trust. Okay, so but there are some online uh, materials that you can search and you can, you can find and, then, and that may help uh, in, uh, to help you to understand the transition process. But more important is actually your, lo your local uh, understand, uh, you have to talk to your pe pediatric service and to understand your local uh, pathway. And then uh, and most of the pediatric um, clinic now, they do transition uh, services with the adult service so that, um, that's, uh, so that we smooth out the transition process. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much for later. That's a really useful introduction to this really quite complicated process that people have to go through when there's so much else happening in their lives as well so thank you so amber um can you tell us a little bit about yourself what you're doing now and and what you you hope to do in the future yeah of course um so hi everyone my name is amber um, I'm 20 years old and I'm currently at the University of Bolton uh, studying special makeup effects for film and TV, um, which is hopefully a industry which I would like to go into um, in the future. So with my um, glaucoma story, um, so I have con congenital glaucoma, um, which is caused by my visible difference. So my visible difference is a Sturge Weber birthmark um, which basically means that all your capillaries and blood vessels in a normal person's skin is a lot lower down on the skin surface but with my skin it's a lot higher up which causes the um, redness to my face um, and also my arms um, and legs. 
so how that kind of affects with my glaucoma. So the same kind of pressure, which is on my skin is obviously in the uh, back of my eyes as well, which then rises my um, glaucoma pressures uh, as well. Um, so yeah, um, so I was diagnosed with my glaucoma at 12 weeks old, um, as well as being diagnosed with my birthmark of Sturge-Weber syndrome. Um, and yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so you were diagnosed quite young. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience of um, the care that you've had and the, the kind of services, the type of clinic you've, you've been to? Yeah, of course. So from being 12 weeks old up until I was about 11 years old, um, I was treated under Birmingham Children's Hospital um, with the amazing team there. Um, so that's kind of consisted over the years of um, a couple of surgeries. So um, when I was first 12 weeks old and diagnosed with my glaucoma, um, my pressures were 70. Um, so they instantly done a muscle release surgery in my right eye. Um, but unfortunately that only lasted till I was about eight months old. And then I had to have the muscle release surgery again, which unfortunately you can only have it done twice. Um, and then that kind of lasted right up until I was eight years old uh, in my right eye until I had to have my um, trepidation. I, can't, I can never say that. <laughs> Trabe Trabeculectomy. That one. <laughs> we always just call it a trapdoor surgery. Um, and I had that um, in my right eye at the age of eight, um, which seems to be lasting quite well. But then unfortunately, then a year later, my glaucoma then spread uh, to my left eye, um, which then I had to then have the same operation done then um, a year later in my left eye. Um, so kind of moving kind of after that I haven't had to luckily thankfully um I haven't had to have no more surgeries since then um and then yeah at the age of um 11 we decided to do the transition early um because I could only stay at Birmingham Children's Hospital until I was 16 anyway um and we decided that because everything was all settled and my pressures were under control and back to um, normal levels and then we were um, lucky enough to come off um, any uh, eye drops and medication that then we decided to do the transition kind of there and then which which actually in the hindsight of things actually worked out quite well because then I'll start in secondary school and kind of all that stress obviously starting a new school um, a much bigger school um, it kind of just helped being a little bit closer to home and receiving care you know which wasn't you know two three hours away from home um, it was only an hour or so away um, and then we then we moved okay and then what happened when you got sort of 16 17 18 and were there any changes for you at that point and or because you'd already done the transition was that it um so quite thankfully where I'm at the hospital which I moved to um Queen's Medical Centre in Nottingham um their kind of um children's um clinic was also kind of doubled up as adults as well so my um doctor um, and consultant was also um trained in um adults so it was something which I could then kind of when obviously moving there at the age of 12 I could then I'm still I've still got the same doctor now so it wasn't as scary as kind of being in the children's department for a couple of years and then go in and then having a new doctor um in my late teens but I think kind of the most thing what affected me kind of in my later teens life was obviously the pandemic and obviously receiving that um constant care obviously when we were in lockdown and unfortunately face-to-face -face appointments were not available and what about the move to university yeah i mean that's been that's quite been a a, a tricky one um definitely um obviously moving kind of from home um, and moving up to Bolton um, on my own. Um, and definitely, definitely, there was definitely some kind of ups and downs with it. And for me, a lot of the time, my stress goes to my weakest parts of my body. Um, and that is my glaucoma and my eyes. So we definitely did notice a bit of a, a bit of a uh, incline in my pressures during that time, just with how much stress I was kind of going under. But I think as anything like you know I just kind of took a deep breath 
you know, kept on carrying on with my regular visits to the hospitals um, and then going back on eye drops, it has soon kind of brought those pressures down and kind of my stress levels have kind of declined a lot. Okay. And is there anything that could have made it easier for you to manage your glaucoma as you reach that sort of transition stage sort of through your teens and to the point where you moved to university? Um, I think definitely those resources, what we've just seen um, in the presentation, I think they would have been definitely quite helpful, not just for me, but also for my parents, because definitely when I moved and kind of moved to the adult clinic, it was kind of less of the doctors and professions talking to my parents and more talking to me about obviously my condition and definitely like having the role now um, later on of you know doing those drops um, and doing those medications on my own rather than always having my parents doing it when I was you know younger in, in my childhood so I think definitely resources like that um, will probably be much great help um, definitely when I was going through that time and probably to to a lot of other people who are also going through that time as well. Mm -hmm. Okay that's brilliant thank you very much and I think you had a question you wanted to ask our audience about the type of clinic they'd been to um, about whether they'd had like a transition clinic yeah so I know on um, you know other types um, of clinics for different of the uh, medical uh, reasons and health issues that there's um, a lot of kind of teen versions of um, these clinics um, like an early adult clinic and I was just wondering if anyone else around obviously the UK have been able to access those or if your hospitals have those available because I think it's definitely something which is much needed of because I found definitely going from one hospital which is all kind of for children it's all colour and all colourful and then you kind of transition into an adult hospital and it's all kind of plain walls and I think that definitely adds quite a lot of kind of anxiety about obviously when you're sat there waiting and you know you're not sure what you're waiting what you're waiting for you know if your pressures are going to be absolutely extreme through the roof or if they're going to be you know settled I think definitely kind of having something like that to kind of settle that anxiety would be would be great and I would definitely love to see that you know in the future. Mm. So if you've got any comments on on that want to share your experience on that then please do put it in the chat everyone. Um, great thank you ever so much Amber. Um, okay so over to you to ask questions folks. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have been sent in by people who haven't been able to attend. Um, so we'll start just with, with one of those. Um, Veloto, this is perhaps one for you. You mentioned transition clinics within hospitals where children's services and adult services get together. Um, but the Transition planning, of course, is much wider than just healthcare. It's also supposed to involve social care, education, and other agencies. Can you tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, how that cross agency working actually happens in reality? Um, I, yeah, that, you're, you're right. Uh, the, transi the transition, we are really focusing on the disease uh, process. And uh, we are, uh, and uh, in Birmingham, so I do, uh, as I said, I do two clinics, uh, transition clinic a year with my colleague, uh, Mr. Albot in the Birmingham Children's Hospital. So that's uh, we, we, we very much focus on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the glaucoma process and uh, what is the development, development of the glaucoma what treatment is needed and uh, well, what treatment has happened before and what uh, treatment is needed in the future. So, and it's not only, only myself, it's also well, some other glaucoma, uh, adult glaucoma colleagues are involved. And also the nurses are, are one of our matrons is involved in the transition process as well. But we don't have um, a social kind of uh, uh, transition uh, that, uh, that, that uh, involved in, in the transition process. It may be something that we should look, 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 look into in the future. 
and uh, but at the moment uh, this, uh, we have been only focusing on the uh, the this 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 the, the disease treatment or the treatment for the uh, child uh, uh, for the for the teenager uh, at, at at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So we've we've had one question um, so far that's asking about the anatomy of the eye. Um, Glad to this will be another one for you. Is whether a bulphalmic eye has the same anatomy as a uh, quotes normal eye? Well, bulphalmic eye depends on bulphalmic is just a sign, just a just a condition that um, yeah, whatever caused the eye pressure to go up, then the bulphalmic eye meaning the eye is like an ox eye, basically. It's in Greek, it's a bulphalmic, and. Um, so basically, if the eye pressure in the eye elevated before the year, before usually about five years old, then the eye used to, then at that time, the, the, the tissue of the eyeball itself is more elastic, especially the, the white tissue of the eye, which is called sclera. They're more elastic so that when, if the eye pressure in the eye is high, then they, are, they can expand, the eyeball can, itself can expand. And then when, when they expand, then the eye can become uh, thinner. The, uh, the, 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 the white tissue of the eyeball is be becoming thinner and the cornea is become thinner. And sometimes the cornea can, uh, uh, the one of the layer, which is more stiff layer, uh, can break. It's called, uh, it can cause some scar tissue on the cornea. And, um, and it also depends on what is the cause of the, of the high pressure in the eyes. If it is, if it is just a congenital glaucoma, then the rest of the eyeball should be the same. It's just the eye becoming uh, thinner. But then if the eye, if, if, if the raised eye pressure is because of the previous cataract surgery, then of course the eye is different because there's no lens inside the eye or there's an artificial lens implant. Or other patients who has got other type of congenital glaucoma like uh, anterior segment dysgenesis, like Sennfeld Riger uh, syndrome, then the, 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 the anterior segment can, be look, can look very different anatomically. But otherwise, the answer, the answer of the question is about, is about the same, but then the, the tissue, the coat of the eyeball is very thin. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Thank you. Um, so an another question that came in, um, in advance. Um, Amber, this is perhaps one for you. Um, young person going to university for the first time um, has glaucoma, um, still has good vision, but not perfect. So some things he needs extra lighting for, um, but most things it doesn't affect him. What, if anything, should he say to his flatmates and his course mates about his glaucoma? Um, I think that's, that's a really good question, really, because I think definitely sharing sharing about your glaucoma because it's quite important about you know close to close ones and people who you're on the course with. I think that's quite important to kind of shed a light so they also get awareness of it. And also, if you're having you know a bad day with your glaucoma, they can also you know help out and do things. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think you know to to say to them you know about it and just be honest I think definitely your glaucoma is the most important thing because you know it's your sight um, and a lot of your future I think definitely a lot of people what I've come to understand about you know having friends who then know about my glaucoma now understand it you know people can be very understanding if you just you know if you just let them know um, and just you know be honest with them um, and I'm sure they'll they'll you know help help you out of course. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so Joe, have you been keeping an eye on the chat? Have we had anything coming in through the chat? Uh, the, the two questions are actually the ones I posted. Um, I'm happy to ask them. Um, so the first one is, is for you, Amber. Is, you know, it can be quite isolated. Not many young people have glaucoma. Were you ever given opportunities to talk to other young people with glaucoma and if you didn't sort of would you have found this helpful um yeah I mean of course I would I would find it completely helpful unfortunately for me there was never really kind of person 
um, of my similar age um, who also had glaucoma, um, kind of who I was in the presence of, you know, at a hospital appointment um, or something like that. But I think I think nowadays, obviously, with having social media and obviously having, you know, the Glaucoma UK charity and having kind of um, a space to reach out to, you can definitely find people of similar ages as well as similar experiences to kind of connect to and kind of bounce off to, to you know, share that share those experiences because you know as as a young child kind of going through a lot of operations and constant hospital visits and checkups and stuff it can be quite daunting so it's, it is quite nice to um have someone kind of to talk to who's obviously been in that situation who isn't a parent or isn't a consultant or specialist yeah great thank you uh and then a, a question which i suppose is for, for later but either of you could answer it which is there's there's sort of obviously different aspects that it might worry you as a as a child compared to an adult and a big one for adults is driving so kind of what support is offered to young people going through that transition you know turning 17 who um, may still have quite good vision um, and want to want to get driving sort of how do you manage all of that aspect of it Again, uh, well, from from our from the clinician point of view is um, we we don't we cannot tell the patients uh, whether they can drive or not, and uh, this, uh, well, we can give them indication well whether the eyesight will be able to pass the uh, legal limit, uh, legal standard for driving, and at least it's very important to start early. Is uh, if they are not going to, we know that their eyesight is not good enough for them to drive, then you, it's very important to start early to tell them that it is unlikely that you will be able to drive, so that they don't have a false hope that you know they will be going up or people telling them they grow up, they can, they can start driving, or even planning to take some driving license. So that is very important uh, from, from our point of view. And it's, just, uh, it's all about expectation. And, uh, and, then, and, then, and then if they have got good enough vision to drive, then they still need to, um, if they have glaucoma and there's significant uh, visual field defects, they will need to tell the DVLA if, as when, uh, when they apply for the uh, for the uh, provisional license, is uh, they need to complete a, a questionnaire that they they did need they need to declare that they both uh, they have glaucoma, and the DVLA may choose to uh, get them to do a visual field test uh, uh, with a, a designated optician to to confirm to see whether they have got uh, enough uh, visual field uh, with uh, both eyes open, being what we call the binocular uh, visual field. Uh, to make sure that they are they 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 can uh, uh, they uh, they can fall into the driving they they can they're within driving standard for uh, uh, the vision the vision standard for driving. Great. Amber, is there anything you want to add to that? Having gone through that process, yeah, of course. So um, as a young adult now, um, learning to drive was something I wanted to do, but. For years, people have said you wouldn't be able to do it just because of kind of your um, vision and glaucoma. And with my glaucoma, I do have limited vision in my right eye. Um, so it was always kind of a worry kind of growing up and seeing kind of everyone else, friends, family kind of doing those kind of normal things of adulthood um, and becoming a young adult. Um, but but um, yeah, as, as it was just mentioned, you know, um, obviously having the regular checks um speaking to your consultants um and obviously just keep on you know having having those checks regularly just to make sure you are able to keep on driving um and, and it, it does give you kind of coming from a person who's kind of had that um done it, it does give you a lot more kind of um independence um and you know for for quite a while of my childhood you know my glaucoma always was one of the things which held me back um but now it's it is you know settled somewhat at the moment um with medication and drops but um yeah driving was one of those things where you know I wanted to do it but you know there was there is going to be a time in the near future where unfortunately that would be taken taken out of my hands and with support you know, university has been great um, with their disability team. You know, there's things in place, you know, if anything was getting to print out, everything would be a little bit larger for me. Um, I would have blue overlay sheets and magnifying glasses um, and stuff like that just to help me as well with like exams, GCSEs. Um, I've always had those kind of in place um, throughout all my education just to help me um, achieve, achieve my goals a little bit easier. 
Great. Thank you. Um, we've had another question again for Velota, really. You mentioned earlier about uh, glaucoma surgeries having a, a lifespan, they don't last forever. And very often transition is the phase when time when they need new treatments. Um, we've had a question in about the, the likely prognosis of someone with congenital glaucoma who's had trabeculectomies. How long a trabeculectomy, I can't say now, trabeculectomy is likely to, to last? Well, it uh, certainly varies between the patients and also vary between the uh, patients that, you know, have, have you had, uh, well, what, what kind of, uh, um, basically where the eyes start from, if the eyes start from uh, quite a complex condition, then the or patient has been using a lot of glaucoma drops many years before they have surgery, then the trabeculectomies may not, uh, so, uh, may, may, may not last uh, that long. But if, if, you, if some patient who uh, had the trabeculectomy surgery done by, when they were very young, and they were not exposed to too long of the glaucoma eye drops. Actually, we found some of them actually can last for a long, long time. So, if the if the uh, for the uh, uh, for for uh, for uh, the, uh, uh, the this patient uh, who actually typed the, uh, asked the question. So, if 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 you have got if you had your surgery done when you when you were very young, and now you're 27, and so many years, more than 20 years, that you're still working. There's there's a good chance that you know you can if you if, if your trabeculectomy has worked for more than twenty years it's very good chance that it's going to work for another ten years, so it's it's it's, it's hard to say no one can no one can tell, and by but for us when we look at when we look at um, uh, we look at the eyes and we look at the um, uh, the amount of uh, drainage from the trabeculectomy or what we call the blab. How was the, the profile or the morphology of the blabs? Then we can tell uh, how good is these blabs working, and you know, how how good is the drainage going, and how, um, how likely you know how long it's going to last. But it's very hard to say. But if, as I said, you know, if it has worked, something has worked for twenty more than twenty years, then likely that something is going to uh, going to work for another ten. Right. Um And Amber, you mentioned a moment ago about support at university. And one of the things that is, of course, available to university students if they have a disability is the disabled students allowance. Is that something you've had experience of? Yes, yes. So, um... So we kind of talked everything through um, for all my conditions um, and definitely there was things for my glaucoma which were put in place, like having, um, for an example, extra uh, printing money um, at the university to print off uh, resources um, and um, like slideshows um, from um, our lessons um, to then make notes on, um, as well as, um, other things like having like extra time um, to complete assignments, you know, if my eyes aren't, you know, kind of playing ball or if they're, you know, acting up a bit or causing me a lot of pain. Um, then there was things like that as well, which which could be um, sorted out with me and my tutors. Yeah, is that all right? So obviously, Amber, your experiences with your two eyes are, are quite different. You know, it sounds like the vision in one is um is is a lot better than the vision in the other eye. Is how much can we use the sort of the, the prognosis of one eye as a guide for what might happen in the other eye? You know, broadly we're symmetrical beings, aren't we? But obviously our experiences are different. So is it have they said anything to you about what to expect in your left eye and sort of how are you preparing for it? Um, not really. We've been, I don't like, with my glaucoma, I don't like to plan too much into the future. I, I wouldn't want to plan, you know, 10 years because everything everything can change so quickly. And at the moment, my trepan up to me is working absolutely great. Um, I've had my one in my right eye um, 
for 12 years and the one in my left eye for 11 years um and as we've just heard you know it can it can vary for how long they last um i mean i was born with uh, the glaucoma in my right eye so my right eye has always been predominantly worse in sight um so my left is kind of the one which i use the most um for driving and, and things and that's kind of my main one which i look out of um which when i like when i like say to like my parents oh yeah i look out my life left eye they don't they don't really understand what i mean um because they've always had you know 20 20 vision in both eyes but i know what i mean and i know i kind of see the world a little bit differently because i'm just kind of seeing it mainly from this side um but yeah i think we never know what's going to happen with the future and um, with my eyes and i think definitely one thing what i've got hopes for is medicine's always changing um, and medication, especially in the glaucoma kind of department is, is always changing and it's evolutionary. And one thing which has always kind of stuck with me, one of the um, eye drops I was on um, when I was younger, um, COSOP, my doctors have always said, you know, eight years prior to your kind of diagnosis at 12 weeks old, that, that eye drop wasn't a thing. Um, and, you know, for eight years, that eye drop, you know, kept my pressures down and, and kept, you know, most of my vision. So. Um, yeah, I think we'll just have to have to see um, what will happen in the future. And I think every every person's case with glaucoma is different. Um, and I think you, you can kind of only share those experiences of what you've gone through, as in operations and procedures and kind of that lifestyle of, of growing up with congenital glaucoma. And we've, we've had another question about how frequently somebody with an adult with congenital glaucoma should be monitored, um, especially in light of COVID and the fact that so many appointments have been delayed. How frequently should people typically be monitored, Velota? Yeah, per perhaps uh, I can, um, uh, before I answer this question, uh, question, perhaps I can just make a comment about Amber's uh, experience. And uh, glaucoma tend to be, uh, childhood glaucoma tend to be worse in one eye because usually one eye is uh, start first and then usually is uh, not normally pick up and until one eye most of the vision is gone and then the and then the child either uh, the cornea if it's very severe then the cornea become cloudy then you started to note uh, to notice or the child started started to develop uh, squint and then because one eye vision has uh, deteriorated uh, bad enough to develop a squint then that's why usually glaucoma usually uh, worse in one eye and most of the a lot of the uh, children with uh, young onset glaucoma they usually have uh, poor vision in one eye because one eye usually become amblyopic when or, or lazy become lazy because uh, the vision is uh, uh, is the uh, poor at, at the big, uh, at the early stage of their life and before the uh, visual center is developed so one eye can become uh, lazy and um, but uh, one but but uh, one eye doesn't do well doesn't mean that the other eye doesn't do well okay and as amber said there are a lot a lot of new new uh, new treatments and um, de being developed at the moment a lot of new procedures that we are doing now even i'm uh, i am now uh, working as a uh, consultant treating pediatric uh, providing pediatric glaucoma service for more than 17 years but is i'm still learning new procedures you know so i'm there are still new procedures uh, going to uh, to uh, come up in the in the near future and uh, uh, in the past there's only uh, or glaucoma surgeries is only trabeclectomy uh, or tube implant surgery but now there are a lot more like a lot of minimally minimally invasive glaucoma surgery and uh, even the uh, what we call a, a trabeclectomy ab internal or gut procedure uh, that's uh, becoming quite uh, popular as well in adults and also uh, we have been doing that for two, for teenagers as well and that seems to be working really well as well so there will be a lot more and even the chip shunt implants now there's a new type of chip shunt implant which is uh, which may may even do better maybe better for the cornea in the long term future so we have it's quite exciting and quite promising that uh, uh, glaucoma uh, uh, young uh, uh, start from young age doesn't always mean that you lose uh, society uh, in 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 uh, some uh, one some point in your life because uh, uh, because there's a lot of development a lot of uh, resources to put into into development in terms of uh, uh, surgery devices and medicine so so that's uh, very positive so I'm 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 feeling very positive um uh at this stage actually about uh, uh childhood glaucoma 
And to answer your uh, one of one of your audience about how often should uh, adult and congenital curcuma be monitored? But uh, like any curcuma, so it depends on the severity. If the curcuma has been very stable, then the, the monitoring shouldn't uh, uh, shouldn't need to be uh, too frequent. But then you know if it's early onset uh, early onset curcuma, they tend to be more complex. So gen generally speaking, we uh, we have to see if even if stable, we have to see a patient for uh, every four to six months. And then if this is more complex or the eye pressure is not stable, then of course, of course we have to see the patient more frequent. Then whether the COVID or not, and um, uh, is, uh, is, is, uh, uh, we still need to see, uh, see those patients, but because of COVID, a lot of, a lot of departments has developed some alternative pathway, uh, try to like some virtual review pathway, like a patient coming to the uh, to the clinic, and uh, to to undergo some tests, and then they don't they don't come back to see the uh, clinician, and, and they just buy, they just have a telephone call. So this has been going on, but but then I think for 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 uh for young uh, curcuma in young people, I um we haven't stopped. We haven't we we have been seeing patients through through the pandemic period. Uh, especially uh, the complex patients. So for complex patients, I think they should really go back to the clinic for face-to-face -face, uh, review uh, without any difference uh, whether it's COVID or not. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And um, another question about the genetics of glaucoma and whether there's a risk that somebody with congenital glaucoma who has children could pass that on to their children. Well, that um, that is uh, likely. You know, there's a genetic component in congenital glaucoma. It depends what type of congenital glaucoma it is. If it's a pure what we call a primary congenital glaucoma, we certainly ident identify the few genes, and um, and that uh, is a like a link to the link to the condition. But if it is a uh, other type of uh, Glaucoma, but early onset, um, and uh, it may not well, it may not be any, uh, it may not have any genetic components into it. So it depends what what type of glaucoma it is. Glaucoma is just a general term, but there the, the etiology of the glaucoma or the, the the reason for the glaucoma can be very different between patient and patients. So what should someone do if they have glaucoma? They're thinking of having children, but they want to know about their particular risk of passing it on. Who should they speak to about that? Yeah, they should they should really speak to their clinician. So if they if they are really keen to find out and, and uh, do some uh, uh, family planning, uh, uh, they 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 can they can speak to their own clinician and then they will uh, they can uh, they can they, they can carry out some genetic tests and then see what's the uh, risk for uh, whether they carry the particular uh, genes that we know uh, that may may may. Uh, may cause uh, congenital glaucoma, but it's very difficult subject because even even some uh, some patients carry the genes that they don't have the glaucoma. A lot of patients uh, carry the the genes that we we think is identified linked to uh, congenital glaucoma, the uh, glaucoma, but they don't have glaucoma. Uh, so it's not it's not that simple. The uh, the the picture is uh, is is not that you you have the genes and then you will definitely get uh, get your, uh, get the congenital glaucoma. It's not like that. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we've just got a couple more minutes. If anyone has any further questions, Joe, is there anything else that's come into the chat? No, 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 there's nothing else in there. Okay, um, great. Okay then. Um, so we've we've dealt with all the questions we've had in so far. If anyone does have any final questions, we might be able to squeeze one or two more in. Um, but if not, we'll, we'll start to draw to a close. Um, so thank you very much, um, both the Lotus Sung and Amber Smith for all your input today. It was really interesting and thank you everybody for joining us and for contributing your questions. Um, Joe, if you could launch the second poll, please. Um, so again, this poll is just to help us um, see how much people have learned during the session. If you've had a question today that you haven't been able to ask, 
or if you think of something afterwards or if you've got anything you'd like to ask about glaucoma you can always get in touch with the glaucoma uk helpline that's open between 9 30 a.m and 5 p.m on monday to friday and you can call them on 01233-648170 or email helpline at glaucoma.uk. Our next online digital glaucoma support group is on the 7th of July at 3 p.m. and that's exploring minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries. And it's with um, an ophthalmologist, Weising Eng from Cardiff and Vale NHS Trust. And then on the 27th of July at 7 pm, we're having one on glaucoma hot topics. So all the frequently asked questions that our helpline get asked will be covered in that session. So we hope that you might join us for those two. And then we're having a bit of a break over summer, but then we'll be back in September with more sessions. So keep a lookout on our website and in our email newsletter for details of what's coming up. Um, when this webinar ends, we're going to launch a survey um, which just asks you for your views on how the session's been, how we can make it better because we do want these sessions to be really useful to everyone. So the more feedback we get, the better. Um, thank you again to everyone. Um, we haven't had any more questions come in as far as I can see. So thank you to everyone and especially to our speakers. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.